Bill Maher, the HBO host, has been on a crusade against wokeness gone too far, and he recently argued that wokeness is going to hurt Democrats at the ballot box. During an interview in Variety magazine, he was asked, what do you view as the Democrats' biggest problem heading into 2024? And he responded, the biggest problem with the Democrats is their woke baggage. I think the Democrats could easily win every election if they didn't do the kind of thing that makes people go, oh my God, this is the party of no common sense. Stop talking about pregnant men and stuff that makes people go, who are these people? What are they talking about? Men don't get pregnant. It's the stuff that makes them very vulnerable because it's very close to home. The environment is an issue and Democrats and democracy is an issue, but those are rather vague in a lot of people's minds. But when my kids come home from school and they're telling me things that are going on in school that I don't agree with, or the teachers think that they have more say in my child's life than I do as the parent, that kind of stuff that's going on in this country, stuff about race and gender and personal stuff that's very up close to people. So I want to ask you two about this because I, I are you three about this really? I, I do feel as though sometimes when this conversation comes up on the broad left and among liberals, there is a kind of pat dismissal of there being any there there at all. But obviously it does seem like the fact that people like Bill Maher and folks that are not necessarily historically associated with the right are getting so much traction out of this means that there is, is something that's happening that is causing people to feel some level of dissonance. You know, how much do you think that this is really an issue that Democrats are actually, let's say, talking about pregnant men, or how much of that is a fictionalized reality that's been created by these kinds of media conversations? Let's start with you, Abby. I do tend to think that it is mostly a fictionalized narrative that is perpetuated by this kind of cyclical nature of the corporate media and kind of the gossipy entertainment aspect of corporate media, where you have the liberal media you know, reacting to right wing media and the right wing media reacting to the liberal media. And so I think that, you know, people on the street, I feel like this is not um, on the forefront of their minds, but but Fox News making it so hysterical and then the liberal media reacting to that hysteria just becomes its own industry. And so people like Bill Maher, you know, he's a very rich, old white man. And it's kind of insulting to hear him just say, we should be catering more and more to the right wing and basically ceding ground to the right wing just because this has been blown out of proportion. I mean, that's his whole position anyway. And that's, I would say, the biggest problem with Democrats is not the woke baggage. It's the fact that they cede ground to the right wing over and over again. And that's exactly what Bill Maher does when he has people on like Ann Coulter, who he buddies up to constantly. Um, it's quite insulting to hear this coming from him saying, oh, gender and all these issues, we shouldn't get too personal. Yeah, okay, when a federal ban on abortion is on the table. All right, dude, I know that this doesn't affect you, but it actually affects a lot of people in this country. Yeah, I think that the point about proportionality is a good one. Yeah. On the other hand, there is, for example, um, an article recently out in The Atlantic that makes the case for no longer sex segregating sports, at least in a kind of pre-college context. You know, I, it, I don't think this is like a widespread thing. I don't think that liberals or leftists as a whole are out there really saying, oh gosh, we've got to get rid of, you know, girls and boys volleyball. But the fact that there does seem to be some element of the left that is willing to pick up this idea, these ideas and push them forward as well. You know, liberal, I know we all have our crit critiques of the Atlantic, but institutions that are perceived as liberals are also pushing these ideas to the foreground, ideas that they think ma majorities of normie Americans probably find to be jarring is that also part of the problem should you know should who, who who can blame them on some level for having the impression that liberals want to radically change the fabric of society when the atlantic is is publishing pieces that say hey let's get rid of girl scouts let's get rid of girls volleyball let's get rid of um you know sex segregated sports altogether or is that actually a direction we should be going in rania 
So I, I tend to agree with Abby on this. I do think a lot of this is part of this culture war that's created by corporate media between the liberals and the conservatives. And it's definitely being overblown uh, by Fox News. Uh, and it is also a distraction, I think, from a lot of real issues that people have to deal with. Like most people aren't walking around thinking about gender in sports. Mm. Most people are thinking about inflation and whether they can afford gas and the fact that their salaries are becoming increasingly worthless because of inflation and the fact that they don't have money to buy a house because they're still paying off this or that debt. Um, I think that's where most people's heads are at. That is that said, you know, the corporate media is really forcing this conversation on us. So we do have to engage with it on on some level. I think Bill Maher, though, is not the person to be engaging on it. And I'll say why. I mean, I think Abby said it perfectly when she called him a rich white guy. He's also just a smug, obnoxious conservative, in my opinion, who pretends to be like a liberal, though he can also, I guess, be considered a smug liberal um, who just like wants to be a part of this. He just wants to talk about he wants to be a culture warrior like this just goes back to the culture war and he wants to be a culture warrior. He sounds like a grumpy old boomer uh, who's just saying, like, what are these kids doing these days? It makes no sense to me. Um, I think there are some legitimate questions, though, about sports and how it should be treated. You know, I grew up being a bit of an athlete myself and, you know, if you asked me like a year ago, I would say, yeah, I do think like there should be sex segregated sports because, you know, girls tend to be, especially in certain sports, right? Girls tend to be like less strong in certain parts of their bodies than men like wrestling. Maybe girls and boys shouldn't be wrestling together. But what I will say I did read this Atlantic yeah. article and I did see this argument that maybe we should be segregating people by ability, um, which actually kind of made a little sense to me. Mm -hmm. So. Maybe there is a conversation to be had here that's like worth it, that isn't just woke culture war stuff. And I didn't really see that article as being a part of the culture war. Yeah, I do think it's interesting. I also was kind of used to, as a non-athlete, so very much as an outsider. But I did think like, it's ridiculous. Of course you have to have, uh, you can't let, uh, I'm gonna get canceled now. I don't think this anymore, <laughs> but I did think like trans women should not be allowed to compete with uh, bio women because they're going to be stronger. But then I realized there, there's so much diversity, and this article spoke to this also, that there's so much diversity within gender. So should be, we be dividing people according to height, strength, um, ability, like you said. So I, but what I think is interesting is that I think that the left, or people who want to argue for desegregating sports by gender, let's say, I think they have to be a little bit less, because sometimes I'll see people yelling at people who think that sports uh, should be segregated. I think we have to understand that a lot of people who aren't transphobic think that it'll be unfair to women if trans women are allowed to compete. Now, I think you can argue against that. I think you can argue that this is a manufactured issue, that there's a lot of uh, hysteria being uh, created. But I think that you have to m explain to people, like, whoa, what about, m make the argument that the article made, right? Yeah. Like, you can explain this to people and not dismiss them as irredeemable transphobes. Because I actually think there's a really important discussion. And I, once I thought about it, it's like, yeah, well, why should someone who's much taller be allowed to compete against someone who's much shorter in running? Yeah, the, the article makes the point that in some sports where physical strength is such a major component of it, like wrestling, it already is segregated by size and weight. You have size and weight classes, right. and that, that could be the same thing. There's this other kind of more cultural aspect of it where, you know, this conversation came up when they talked about uh, integrating Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, whether or not there's a value to having gender segregated education. Um, there's studies that show that women perform well in right. segregated math classes because of all of the social reasons they might feel pressure not to speak up in those contexts and mixed contexts in school. And I wonder what you think of that the kind of cultural loss of not having, let's say, your, your women's soccer team or your women's field hockey team, just like you might miss out on having a, a woman's uh, primary school education or the Girl Scouts. Right. I don't know. I'm torn on this because I do think that women feel a lot of pressure when men are around, like you were saying, or sometimes that they'll feel stifled. They don't want to say things. And I think there's a real, like, community and solidarity when you have mm -hmm. all women classes or all women institutions. But I would say that that doesn't mean that uh, trans women are excluded from it. For sure. So for me, that ex includes trans women. Yes, but what about the men? N I think it's <laughs> fine to exclude men. Not all men. <laughs> Not all men. But I do think I mean, it's the value to all crazy women's how, education. It's crazy how, how hard it is to have this conversation. Yeah. I will say that. This is a very difficult conversation to have. It's something I try to 
honestly stay away from because I see other people who have this conversation, you know, just getting like relentlessly beat up either which way. Um, and that makes it very difficult to have an open discussion among people who are speaking in good faith, I think. And it's well, unfortunate. I, I, I think that the article is interesting because um, I disagreed with the overall premise of it, which is that it's totally cultural mythology yeah, that I there are too. biological differences between men and women. I completely disagree. Um, I think that there is obviously a hierarchical power structure that, um, you know, that that's why women have felt subjugated in terms of like the power and nature of how men can be. I mean, the fact that I am scared of being murdered. I feel like I have to hold pepper spray when I walk to my car because I can be overpowered by a man or when you're dating someone. I mean, that's why rape and murder are very prevalent um, in terms of power dynamics and relationships and things like that. So I, I thought it was an odd article. Um, and I think it is completely different than actually making the argument of trans people being able to play in their respective sports teams. Because yes, I, I do think that a trans woman who is transitioning and on hormones should be able to play on an all female sports team. But I think that there are clear differences um, when you're looking at gender segregation and sports and that if if it were just a male sport, it would be completely dominated by males because naturally, biologically, men are stronger. So, yeah. you know, it's just an yeah. interesting, bizarre thing. And, and yeah, it does. It, it is weird when you see people in the Atlantic pushing an argument like this, because it just to me, it is like taking it in a really weird direction that I feel like is not rooted in reality. Like so, using the trans yeah. issue to get rid of like women's sports. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I yeah. will say the last thing I would add to this conversation is that I think this is a kind of uh, manufactured hysteria. And even when Bill Maher talks about the Democrats woke baggage, like I don't hear Joe Biden talking about women in sports. Right. I don't hear him talking about pregnant people or pregnant men. Same thing with the Demo people are like, oh, the Democrats are running on uh, defund the police. It's like, no, they're not. Where is that coming from? So I do think it's like this boogeyman that doesn't even exist. And then we can have well, the conversation. Bill about. Maher was just out there saying white people own slaves too, guys. I mean, he thinks Black he's so goddamn edgy. Black this people, guy is yeah. a moron. It's like, really? Are you, you need to be schooled by Marianne Williamson, dude. Get her ass on your show. <laughs> yeah. the most she has been he off. acts she like this back, maverick. Yeah. He acts like this maverick right. who like is old, who isn't scared to say anything. But he's just right. a boring like version of everything that we see in the mainstream like there is nothing unique or special about you bill maher you are like everybody else like come, come seriously i'm just so sick <laughs> right. of his attitude yeah come on come on and debate me bill maher seriously whatever it takes all right we'll, we'll leave it there thank the, thank you to both of you for joining us thank for this panel so on all of these panels today yes this was so much fun we'll uh, see you next time <laughs> all right take care so fun, you guys.